Welcome back to The World Over. Pope Francis ordered the publication of two documents, and they were published this week. They appear to support communion for divorced and civilly remarried Catholics without annulments. Does this decision represent a clear break with age-old church teaching? And if it does, what are the implications for the church at large? Here with analysis is the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal, and Father Gerald Murray, canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. A treat to have you both in the, in the house, the whole posse in the house. I want to start by giving the viewers a little backstory here. There was a letter written by the Argentinian bishops after the synod, after the Pope published a document called Amoris Laetitia. There was a lot of controversy. What does it mean? What does it say? The bishops of Argentina had this to say. This was from September of 2016. They write, In other more complex circumstances, and when it is not possible to obtain a declaration of nullity, the aforementioned option may not, in fact, be feasible. Nonetheless, it is equally possible to undertake a journey of discernment if one arrives at the recognition that, in a particular case, there are limitations that diminish responsibility of culpability. Uh, they're, now, they're talking about people who are married and remarried, particularly when a person judges that he would fall into a subsequent fault by damaging the children of the new union. So when they're remarried and have children, Amoris Laetitia opens up the possibility of access to the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist. These, in turn, dispose the person to continue maturing and growing with the aid of grace. Now, we reported on this when it happened, when this letter dropped, and then the second shoe dropped, and that was the Pope affirming this letter from the Argentinian bishops, where he said, the document is very good and completely explains the meaning of chapter 8 of Amoris Laetitia. There are no other interpretations, and I am certain it will do much good. May the Lord reward this effort of pastoral charity. What does that mean? Where are we now that this has been published, and we'll talk about that in the next movement here, uh, this has been published in the official Acts of the Vatican. What does that mean, Father Gerald Murray? Well, it's an attempt at clarification, I think, from the Pope of what he intends, but I think it's only creating more confusion. And I'll say that because what we have here is a statement by the Argentinian bishops that people who are engaged in adulterous activity mm -hmm. can claim diminished culpability and can claim that they're actually growing in grace by continuing to commit acts of adultery. Mm. That is false. That denies Catholic teaching. Adultery is a mortal sin. We know what adultery is. It means having sexual relations with someone to whom you are not married. Mm. Now, for the Pope to then put this and say this is the only possible interpretation of Amoris Laetitiae right. indicates to me that we have a serious problem now coming forward, which is precisely what Cardinal Burke and the other cardinals who submitted the dubia, which is, about. is Catholic teaching under assault by Amoris Laetitiae? Are we now saying mm -hmm. that certain cases of adultery are no longer gravely sinful and that people who publicly engage in this behavior are to be treated as if they're in the state of grace and should be given the sacraments? Robert Royal, I want you to respond to this. In an interview with Catholic News Service, Cardinal Francesco Coco Palmiero, the president of the Pontifical Council for Legislative Texts, had this to say about the letter and the Argentine bishop's interpretation being published in the official record of Vatican Acts. He said, the fact that the Pope requested that his letter and the interpretations of the Buenos Aires bishops be published in AAS, the Vatican Official Acts, means that His Holiness has given these documents a particular qualification that elevates them to the level of being official teachings of the Church. While the content of the Pope's letter itself does not contain teachings on faith and morals, it does point toward the interpretations of the Argentine bishops and confirms their authentically reflecting his own mind. Thus, together, the two documents become the Holy Father's authentic magisterium for the whole church. Is this authentic magisterium? Well, as we've said so many times here when we've gotten together, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I know, I, I believe, agree entirely with what Father just said in terms of what 
that seems to be affirming. Mm -hmm. There are other canon lawyers, theologians, who say that there are ways in which one can interpret that Argentinian letter that is in harmony with previous orthodox teaching. At the same time, they say that a similar statement on the same subject by the bishops in Malta cannot be affirmed, and we didn't see any criticism of that. So what we have is still a, 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 a set of doubts. This letter, by the way, wasn't published. It, it, the right. shoe didn't drop, the way yeah. you put it. Yeah, it it actually leaked. kind of was leaked at a certain mm -hmm. point, and I think this continues to reflect the nervousness. I think the Holy Father's nervousness about being too open in mm -hmm. affirming something that, if affirmed without a lot of qualification, is going to look like a direct contradiction of the uh -huh. tradition. Father Gerald Murray, you'll remember when that letter dropped, a lot of people were saying, well, wait a minute, this hasn't even been published in the official acts of the Vatican, so it doesn't, we need, we're giving this too much credit. Well, now it has. Does this represent a rupture, a breakage, with what has been taught by, certainly, the last, the popes, all of the popes in historical memory, as far as we can remember, right back to Jesus. Look, there can be no rupture about Catholic teaching. Whether it's properly affirmed or seemingly denied, it still remains what it is. I think back, let's say Amoris Laetitia had been issued by Archbishop Bergoglio, Cardinal Bergoglio, when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires. I'm certain that it would have been sent to Rome and the Congregation of Doctrine of Faith would have looked at it and said, this is not in harmony with the teachings of authentically taught by, among other things, a code of canon law, Pope John mm -hmm. Paul II, Pope Benedict. In other words, what we're dealing with now as something that the Pope has said is his authentic magisterium is not, would not have been recognizably uh, in harmony with the Catholic teaching if he had issued it as the bishop in Buenos Aires. I know, but now he's Pope. Right, but you think the papal power, I remember in seminary they used to tell us the Pope can't wake up tomorrow morning you say there's a fourth person in the Trinity. Now, in the moral teaching, it's a similar thing. It's not the same level of degree uh, of doctrinal importance, but you can't wake up and say tomorrow, there's a category of adultery that we no longer call adultery, right? which is if people don't think that they're really committing offense if they receive communion when they're in an invalid second marriage. We have to be clear. The teaching of the church is designed to help people get to heaven, not feel good about themselves. You really want to feel good at yourself? Be in the state of grace and don't publicly violate the church's teaching. Mm. That's the message I think that's getting lost here. Well, it also sounds like there's a new category. There's a fast pass to the sacraments for adulterers if you have a kid. If you have a kid involved, according to the Argentinian bishops, now affirmed by the Pope, now published in the Vatican Acts, that if you have a child and the fear of causing scandal to that child of this new union, forget the kids you might have had with the first wife, let's not even talk about her, but the, the, the new union, that this is enough to somehow grant you access to the sacraments. Isn't that what's being said here? Yeah, and this has been argued over and over again because that argument has been made in, in other contexts. We've heard, by, from, yeah, we, we, we've heard this many Spadaro times. Spadaro and a number of, of, of people near the Pope have made this argument. Many times. Look, technically, again, there are some things that the, the Argentinian bishops built in there that are qualifications. However, as we know from the case of contraception in the Episcopal Church and, and similar attempts to be mm -hmm. modern on these issues, Whatever qualifications, limitations people try to put on these things in this particular culture mm -hmm. will inevitably start a process, and that's a word that the Pope likes to use, it'll right. start a process, where do we stop? You know, do, do we stop because I have children now? Do we stop because my parents brought me up badly and I was psychologically mm -hmm. damaged? I mean, there are annulment cases that are proceed along those lines. Right. But there's an infinite number of exceptions to what used to be thought of, and not only by theologians and bishops and whatnot, but by the, by the, the average guy in the street if, up until, say, 1960, if you picked any Catholic out of a church on a Sunday morning and said, can you receive communion after being divorced and remarried, they would say, well, of course not. I mean, it's, it's just, mm -hmm. it's assumed that, that that simply can't happen. Yeah. So we're in, the, we're in a situation where, um, yeah, you try to be merciful, but you, you're merciful in a way that opens a door that you may not be able to close after people pass through it. Cardinal Gerhard Müller, who was head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, said that no discipline and no doctrine of the church had been changed with Amoris Laetitia. This letter and the elevation of it would seem to disprove or argue against his point. 
I would agree with Cardinal Muller in the sense it's impossible to overthrow Catholic doctrine okay. by publishing something. So in, then what in, is this? What is it? I think it's part of the papal attempt to gain acceptance for his point of view, mm -hmm. which is that the previous discipline was too harsh and we have to go to what's called a case-by-case -case analysis. For me, revelation, which is precisely what the words of Jesus are, mm -hmm. if a man divorces a wife and marries another, he commits adultery, that covers all cases. Mm -hmm. There is no case-by-case -case exception right. to that. Now, how do we deal with people who find themselves in this situation? We preach, we say, do not commit sin. If there are children, the church can contemplate giving the advice that those people can live as brother and but sister. But there's a tribunal set up in every diocese to handle these cases, to review. There's a legislative process, a court process. Well, that's for marriages that are viewed, to, uh, thought to be invalid. Right. Uh, this is dealing with the person who says, my marriage is perfectly valid. I just got out of it. Now I'm in a second relationship. Right. We can't do this. No. You know, you can't, this doctrine, discipline, the whole, everything goes together, which is why this is so troubling. And I think the, the, the dubia cardinal are right. Either we get moral precision in the teaching of the church or we're going to fall into chaos. I want to place, put something up on the screen for you, Robert Royal. Uh, Dr. Ed Peters, who is a professor of canon law, raised a very interesting point in an article. He's a, a professor of canon law at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. He wrote this. Unless Canon 915 itself is directly revoked, gutted, or neutered, it binds ministers of Holy Communion to withhold that most august sacrament from, among others, divorced and remarried Catholics, except where such couples live as brother and sister and without scandal to the community. If you change practice, you change doctrine, it seems to me. By this shift, represented in that letter from the Argentine bishops, have they gutted Canon 915, or is there a contradiction that we're looking at? Well, I should probably leave the answer to that part to the canon okay. lawyer, but I'll say this, yeah. that this entire development seems to me to, to inevitably call into question things like that. Why not then? If we're, right. we're going to make the change, there's a reason why we have an orderly process in the church, because it's like, it's like the, the secular legal system. Somebody accuses somebody of something else. Evidence gets presented, and then a judge and a jury or, or somebody tries to adjudicate what is the truth, what is justice mm -hmm. to be done in the, these circumstances. If you're going to just issue a letter about somebody else's document and say that nothing else in Catholicism matters, I mean, these are, are things that touch upon the nature of the Eucharist, about our unity marriage. with Christ, it's, about it's marriage, two sacraments. about what the church is. Do, do, or do we just make these discrete changes and then we don't care if there are canon law that contradicts things that, mm -hmm. that are being affirmed in some, some lower level document? I, I think that this, this way of proceeding itself, we, we, people occasionally accuse me of trying to create confusion or underlying confusion. The confusion is there. It hasn't been mm. created by us. It's been noticed that yeah. there are all sorts of other Catholic things in play when a document like this is published. I know. It's easier to kill the messenger, but, you know, we didn't create the message. Father Gerald Murray, I keep getting questions about this. It's, I, I've heard them all week since this, this document was published. Is a priest or a bishop obligated to follow Canon 915, which forbids giving the Eucharist to those who are not worthy to receive it, or do they make these exceptions today, given that this is now part of the authentic magisterium, as put forward by Pope Francis and... Uh, Cardinal uh, Palmiero. Right. Well, the um, permission by the Pope uh, in Amor Satitia, in uh, the famous footnote, that the accompaniment can include the sacraments is only a permission. It's not a command. Canon 915 remains. Those who are publicly engaged in grave moral offenses can be denied or should be denied the sacraments because we want to pr preserve the church from scandal. Mm -hmm. The problem, of, as Bob points out very, very well, is that the legal order in the church has to be a unified uh, presentation in order to be intelligible. So we have the bishop, the Archbishop of Lisbon just came out with a statement saying that now divorce and remarry Catholics in his diocese are going to be given the sacraments. The bishops of Malta said the same thing, and they basically left it up to the people to decide for themselves. Right. Canon 915 is still in, the, in still vigor. The force it's still, of law. It still has the force of law, and it guides my practice. Now, as a priest, I'll tell you this. My goal is to help people get to heaven. The biggest obstacle to that is sin. Ignorance comes in second, maybe they're together. How do you get rid of sin and ignorance? You tell people the truth, and you help them to live it. 
you don't create this false notion where someone who knows adultery is wrong mm -hmm. can have diminished culpability because they don't like the fact that it's wrong. And yeah. I think that's what's this dynamic, which applies to so many other things. Yeah. Why can't you tell a couple that says, well, we don't really understand the church's teaching on contraception, therefore it's a good thing for us to continue to use it. Mm -hmm. You tell them, don't do that because it offends God. Mm -hmm. Now, this language is very absent from many discussions now. Yeah. The reason why I'm a priest, the reason why the church exists, to give honor and glory to God, not to make arrangements so that people can excuse mm -hmm. bad behavior. And so, I think this is where we're at. So what, what we really do have, uh, we really have to be honest and say, this has created a crisis in the heart of the church over two major sacraments, and it is unresolved. And it seems to me the effort to clarify by inserting this in the Vatican official acts only muddies the water and causes more confusion, it would seem to me. Yeah, and let's say this, because there's been a lot of discussion about mercy, right. about accompanying, accompanying people, people. And, and whatnot. I'm going to make a bold statement in the presence of a canon lawyer. Mm -hmm. Canon 915 is defending the words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. These are the words of Jesus about the indissolubility of marriage over against the Pharisees, who everyone thinks were hard-hearted legalists, mm -hmm. who had allowed divorce. And this is something that went directly against mm -hmm. the Judaism of his day, and it stands out, uh, scripture scholars will tell you, it stands out like a sore thumb because it is not part of his contemporary culture. He's right. making a statement that they would have found surprising. Mm -hmm. And it isn't a statement of loosening. It's a, a statement of, from the very beginning, mm. in Genesis, this is the way God wanted things to be. Mm. Before I run out of time, there's a new book called uh, provocatively The Dictator Pope that is gaining a lot of attention. I know you reviewed it. You both have read it. What do we need to know about this? There are some bold insinuations made in the book. What's your overall take? I think it, I've said that it's about, I think it's 90 percent accurate. And we, actually, we've talked about many of the things that are in oh. the book, and we've all been involved over in events in Rome where, sure. where some of where these we've things seen some of this have, happen. have happened. I think it's a little bit unfortunate that he used such an inflammatory title as a dictator pope because, mm -hmm. look, the pope is the pope. We have to be loyal to him. We have to try to help him mm -hmm. to be um, to carry out his charism as, as the successor of Peter. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that most of the stuff that he talks about, the, that the way, the the problems with the way that Pope Francis has gone about running the church. Solid. He goes beyond the evidence in a few places. There's an unfortunate rumor that he repeats that mm. somehow the Vatican made contributions to Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign, campaign which, sounds, which sounds like it's a crazy book. But that's only one page very near, maybe one, two pages uh, scattered throughout the book. A lot of it is worth reading. It's a short book. It's well documented. It's well documented by, by many things that are, mm -hmm. that are in the public square. Anybody, I think, who is curious to know what exactly um, th this papacy has been doing mm -hmm. ought to be aware of the material in that volume. Father, the deputy director general of the Vatican Bank, which got almost no coverage, was walked out of his office last week, taken out of the Vatican walls and put on the street. He is not the first official connected with the Vatican Bank to be walked out or unceremoniously fired. What of the reform of the economic structure of the Vatican, which is the reason Pope Francis was elected and why so many people filled his name in on the ballot, because they wanted a reformer. He was sold as a reform pope. Is that what we're dealing with? This is a topic that's covered in this book, which with the provocative title, The Dictator Pope, and I would agree with Bob that the uh, accuracy and the depth and uh, bringing together of lots of information is very useful. It helps interpret this latest firing. Yeah. There have been a lot of attempts, uh, and the Pope, this is one of the things I praised him on when he first well, came in, said he wanted to clean it up, yeah. put Cardinal Pell in charge. Economic and then, secretary. Yeah, and then boom, everything got chipped away. Uh, mm. Reform efforts seemed to get bypassed. Uh, we as Americans, I think, uh, you know, are very conscious that having an mm -hmm. audit is not a pleasant thing, but it's a good thing to, to, to establish institutional credibility. Mm -hmm. And transparency. Yeah, the Vatican auditor was fired recently, yeah. you know, so... Uh, and that was after Price Waterhouse was right. shown the door, you know, well, and we were, yeah. after uh, J.P. Morgan was supposed to get uh, in, in transparency that Benedict set up, they were supposed to get annual reports. The Vatican never made the reports to J.P. Morgan. I mean... The, the, there is no transparency. Well, and, and this, the auditors, have, there's a string of them, you know, along the Tiber. Well, this is the thing that I think the Pope really should take up uh, and realize that he's losing a lot of credibility uh, with people who see him as a reformer 
if the status quo ante, meaning the, the chaos mm -hmm. in the past, is not dealt with more effectively, and people being fired, walked out of buildings without explanation, this is not how you do that. I want to quickly touch on the Pope's trip to Asia last week. He went to Myanmar. Uh, tell me about that visit. What stood out to you? It was, it was a rather remarkable visit in what he said. Yeah, I, I mean, we've, we've said a lot of critical things. I think that what he did there is, is something... Uh, remarkable because he, it could have been an utter disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, even diplomatic yes, landmines. Se secular commentaries were that he shouldn't do this. He's stepping into the middle of a uh, of a conflict between Buddhists and and the Rohingya, Muslims. who are mu mm -hmm. Muslims who have been driven into Bangladesh by the, the Buddhist majority in um, in Myanmar. But he handled it very very well. Now there are some people who say he should have spoken out. Bold, While it was in know. Myanmar. This is the same kind of thing that people said about Pius XII, that right. he should have spoken out against the Nazis. But we know that sometimes a moral leader speaking out like that creates further uh, problems right. for Catholics, for, for mm -hmm. Muslims, etc. So I think he handled that well. He says that he, he spoke with the, the military leaders in Myanmar General. very candidly about what their moral responsibilities were. And I think he was his presence in, in Bangladesh was rather charming, the way yeah. he spoke with people. So... Um, you know, let's give him a lot of credit. This was good this visit. was a good thing. Good visit. Yeah, agreed. And uh, we should also remember he's there to strengthen the faith of the Burmese Myanmar Catholics. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a small but very vibrant uh, church, and in Bangladesh, similarly, the Pope going to these non-Catholic countries to strengthen the Catholic population, I think, is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Well, Papal Posse, Merry Christmas. We'll see you in the new year, if not sooner. Thank you both for being here. You can follow Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray's commentary at CatholicThing.org, and also read. Robert's review of that, uh, that book, which is very interesting reading.